uh, we're just going to videotape today. Um, that way, I can prove in a court of law that I, when I go before <laughs> St. Peter, I said, yes, I talked to him. I, I swear, I told him. Uh, we're doing that so that we can um, put up maybe excerpts and stuff on our Be Catholic uh, website that uh, Andy and I started. So, Andy, you want to just yeah. real quick? Yeah, so we got some uh, attendee sheets right here. We're going to just collect basic information, uh, email, phone number. Mainly keep in contact with you should something with the class change, whether if we have to cancel a night or inclement weather or anything else. And we got a couple survey questions to, <laughs> on it to kind of gauge where people are and what they're here for and how you heard about us and uh, additional fields, uh, additional field you can fill out. To, uh, just let us know if there's something in particular you want out of the program. Uh, if you got, uh, you know, particular. Uh, area of interest or you know just give us some feedback on it so and there should be a pin on each desk <laughs> the chair i'm sorry we only have one for each desk so. and before you came we already uh did a little five minute snippet on uh, making the sign of the cross so none of you were here, so if you want to learn about that, you're going to have to come to the website and uh, see what I had to say about making the sign of the cross. And actually, yes, ma'am. Okay, I don't know this gentleman, and I'd kind of like to know his background. His name is Andy Lang, and Andy will let you know. Okay. Go ahead, Andy. I get, I get to do my dog and pony show. You get to do it. <laughs> my name is Andy Lang. Um, I actually started as a parishioner here at St. George back in 80. <laughs> time frame to age myself a little bit here. Uh, and uh, after uh, um, graduated high school, went to East Coweta and left for a number of years and then moved back uh, into the area. Uh, probably about a 97 time frame or so. And we're down to Noonan here. Again, I was living up in Mableton for a while, but wanted to come back to Noonan. Uh, and uh, been here ever since. But I have a wife named Pam and a daughter named Nora who's over there doing her homework. So, uh, but yeah, appreciate you guys making it out here. We're really excited about the program and hope that, uh, you know, you can get something out of it. <laughs> we'll try our best. How, how long have you been, have you been Catholic all your life? Yes, ma'am. I was okay. a cradle Catholic, but like a lot of Catholics, I kind of fell off the bandwagon when I went to school. And, you know, it was only until just shortly before my daughter was born that I kind of started going, you know, something's kind of missing. And, and I had actually gone to a minor seminary. This used to be a redemptor's parish. So every year they would have uh, priests come through and you know you go for there for the summer and the particular seminary was in northeast Pennsylvania uh, St. Mary's Seminary and I actually went there you know I had thoughts of doing priesthood but personal life kind of fell apart and, uh, you know my mom and dad divorced and everything so it just kind of upended you know a lot of that uh, I guess thought process so and then when I went to school, you know, like a lot of people, I was more concerned with career and everything else and went away from the faith. But it was always that kind of nagging, empty feeling that I had, you know, that something's missing. You know, I got all this, you know, I got a career, you know, starting a family, but there's a big hole there. And, you know, you, you realize it, you know, when I start coming back, it's like, yeah, you know what? This is what I was missing and everything. So it's been a, you know, a lot, it's a common, I think, a thread for a lot of people. You know, and of course, I wish I'd never left, but I'm so glad I came back. And, and you know, it's been a, um, you know, really fulfilling time for me because it's really helped inspire me, uh, you know, faith-wise and everything else. So. Good. Thank you. We didn't get the question. What's that? We didn't get the questionnaires you hand out. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's okay. All right. Well, we love Andy, and I'll tell you what, I couldn't do this without him. Thank you. 
he's, he's a good man, and he puts up with me, and that proves it right there. <laughs> all right, so uh, we'll get started now. We're going to start the way we start all things as Catholics, and that is with the sign of the cross and with prayer, right? So in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, we ask for you now to send your Holy Spirit upon us. Be with us here today. Open our hearts and our minds to that which you want us to know. Help us to grow closer to you in love and faith and in knowledge. Be with us while we do that and as we leave. And may that blessing extend to all of our families and to everyone that we meet through the week. And we ask this in your most holy name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, as I said uh, before, uh, one of the things that identifies us uh, to the outside world as Catholics, one of the things that people associate probably uh, most, especially with Catholics, is making that sign, the sign of the cross, right? And uh, as cradle Catholics, uh, we, we grew up with that. We did it like breathing. We never thought about it in any other way. Um, but to those that uh, were not Catholic, or um, our Protestant brothers and sisters, for instance, it's something that they look at like, wow, that's, that's different. Maybe even that's strange. I don't know what it is. Um, and to uh, a lot of Catholics, uh, they're, sometimes they feel embarrassed to do that unless they're right in church, you know. I, uh, I can't do that. I, when I go over here to go get some Mexican food or go to the nice restaurant and sit down somewhere and we get our food, and someone says, let's pray, it's like, uh, I don't know what to do, what, especially if I do this, everybody's going to know <laughs> that I'm Right? Um, but as we had been talking about before when we got in here is that you never know when you're witnessing your faith to somebody else and a simple gesture like that can mean something very uh, striking and important to the people around you because if there's another Catholic sitting near you for instance and maybe they're a little embarrassed and they see you have the courage of your convictions and your faith to do that, maybe you've just given them a little bit of courage to, to do it next time or even at the end of their meal, for instance. Um, or uh, a waiter or a waitress or a server, somebody that comes to you, they, they might come over and say something to you like, hey, I saw you made the sign of the cross. I'm Catholic too. Or, hey, what does that mean? I've seen you do that before in here. So now you have a chance to witness to your faith. And that's the whole point. That's why we're here. That's why we're doing this. And that is simply to help people to come to understand what it is to be Christian and what it is to be Catholic. And if you're here and you're not Catholic and you're just here to learn, I applaud you for your courage and uh, for your desire to grow and in knowledge of God. If you're Catholic here to kind of brush the rust off and oh my gosh, who doesn't need to do that from time to time? I thank you for that. If you're thinking about coming into the Catholic Church, you've come to the right place because this is where uh, we'll give you all the information for you to be able to make that decision on your own. So uh, we're gonna kind of start off uh, this uh, whole so shall we say nine months of study, if you want to go through the whole thing, it should be at least probably seven, eight months of coming here once a week and growing in our faith and growing in our knowledge. But we can't do that unless we say, well, what is it that we're actually doing? What is it that we're trying to accomplish? And so the very first thing is, as you'll see on your, um, on your list of what we hope to accomplish, and that is, well, what is it to be Catholic? What is Catholicism? What is that? It sounds like, oh my gosh, I gotta go to the doctor. They told me I, I come down with Catholicism. I sure hope there's a 
you know, a shot or something for that, right? Um, but, so if I was to ask you to think for a second and say, what is Catholicism or what is being Catholic, right? Notice I put that plug in there, right? Be Catholic. So what is it to be Catholic? Think about it for a second, and then I'm going to force you to answer. I'm going to kick at you. So when you think about being Catholic or someone you know that's Catholic or when you see something on TV it talks about Catholicism, what are some of the things that come to your mind? I don't really think about being Catholic. I, I think being a Christian. Okay, so that would be the first point, right? So is being Catholic... Being Christian? Yes, right? So let's write that up here on the board. All right, what else? The Eucharist. Hmm? The Eucharist. The Eucharist, okay, that's a really big word, right? And we'll have to define what that is, but Eucharist, or in Catholic shorthand, communion, or Holy Communion. What else? It's a specific path to Christ. Okay, so Bible. it's a path to Christ, right? So It's almost like a textbook. Okay, good, I like that. So a path to Christ. And I would say one thing that sets it apart from other Christian paths would be saints. Saints. Let's put that over here. So now we're coming into things that people specifically uh, associate with, with being Catholic, right? So we can, we'll come to that in a second. But what is, is being Catholic? I think we just really hit on something really important here. Christ, right? which is kind of the root word here for Christian, right? So we have to say that being Catholic means that we believe in Jesus Christ. But who is Jesus Christ? See, now we get into the squishy area. Yes? I think it's also a belief in the, the Virgin Mary. Okay, let's put let us put the Virgin Mary over here because again, that is <coughs> something that is very much associated specifically with being Catholic, right? But what is Catholicism? It's being Christian. The Eucharist, yes, the Eucharist is Christ, and we'll learn about this um, specifically a little bit later. But it is the church of Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ is who? God. God. So we have to start off with that we believe in God. Well, a lot of people in the world claim to believe in God. <coughs> so what makes Catholicism or Christianity special about believing in God? Christ is the Son of God. Well, if there's a Son, that implies there must be a Father. Father. All right, now we got Father and Son. <coughs> what else do we have? We got Spirit. We got the Holy Spirit. So now we got Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But we said we believe in God, duh, not God, So, what sets us apart as Christians? And as Catholics, is the belief in one God as defined to us as three persons. And we have a name for that, right? The Trinity. Not just somebody from the Matrix, right? <laughs> so... One God, 
three persons. But doesn't most of your, um, I mean, I was brought up Protestant, so we were all taught that. You don't say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's one God, three persons, a trinity. That's the whole of Christian faith. Exactly. And I totally agree with you. So we just said that being Catholic is being Christian. And not just being Christian. What was the original Christian group? The Catholic Church. So what does Catholic mean then? What does that mean? Well, the fact that, uh, that you brought that up, that's one of the things that we want to point out. Catholicism is one of the three branches of Christianity. Catholic, Eastern, Protestant. Are they three completely separate religions? Nod your heads one way or another. What, what is it? You said Eastern? The Eastern, right. Eastern Orthodox. Okay. Eastern Orthodox. Right? So you have Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, and Protestant. Those all form the one body that we call Christian. Christian. But if we go back to the beginning, we go back to when Jesus says to his apostles, hey, this is the church. Now go forth, and we'll talk about that very specific uh, passage in Matthew 16, 17 through 19, where he talks to Peter. Um, the church was one body, one baptism, one Lord, one faith, right? Mm -hmm. For how many years? Let's be really conservative. At least a thousand years. At least a thousand years before we even had a differentiation between Catholic or anything else that believed in Jesus Christ. Now that doesn't mean there weren't arguments all along the way, and we'll talk about that too, the various heresies and the the various uh, disagreements over, uh, well, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, and you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus Christ? I don't know. Let's go ask the bishop, right? And then the bishops are like, this didn't come with a manual, so we need to talk about this. We need to figure it out. So that's where we get up here to the three people. But Catholic means... universal in the sense of uni, universal, everywhere as one, the same everywhere. This word Catholic was used shortly after the word Christian came into being. We read in Acts of the Apostles that it was in Antioch that they were first referred to as Christians, right? Because they were followers of Christ. And that took place probably in 40 AD, where that word first came out. Well, probably within 50 years written, but probably a lot earlier than that, we had someone called St. Ignatius of Antioch, who was the bishop of Antioch. Antioch was where they were first called Christian. And the bishop at that time had just been uh, put under lock and chain and was going to be marched all the way to the Flavian uh, Amphitheater, which is, we know as the Roman Colosseum where he was going to be fed to the lions, and he was, in fact, fed to the lions. But uh, along his way, he wrote to all the various churches that had been set up already. 
And in one of his letters, he said, wherever the bishop is, let the people be. Just where, as is, where Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. And that took place in the year 107 AD. So for people that say, well, this word Catholic was kind of made up, it's like, yeah, it was made up 2,000 years ago. Catholic means universal. Catholic means of one, the same everywhere. And even Jesus, uh, when he spoke to the Father, as recorded through uh, the Gospel of John in uh, chapter 17, says that they may be one as the Father and I are one. So when we start to talk about the Trinity, we're going to start talking about what are those qualities of God that we're supposed to mirror in ourselves and in our community? And of course, probably the most important thing that defines God and everything that God does is one. Okay. So does that help you? Does that help you a little bit understand uh, Christian, Catholic, we'll get to. A lot of people say, uh, and there are some people that believe that Catholics are not Christians. That would be like your grandfather starting this really great business, and you're the great-great-grandson, and you say, great-great-granddad didn't know a thing about this business. Like, well, how did this business come about if he didn't know what he was doing? Where did you get all your knowledge from? Uh, in scripture, even in Romans, it talks about how Gentiles, and I'm sure you've heard that word before, Gentile just means non-Jew, how the Gentiles could only be saved by being grafted onto the root of Judaism. Well, in the same way, we could kind of say the same thing happened with Protestants and Catholics. When Protestants broke away, they were had the reason they were able to continue to grow was because they were still grafted onto the root of Catholicism, of being Catholic. That's not said with any type of pride or anything. It's it's the truth. That's how it. They couldn't get to where they were unless they had been fed and blossomed from somewhere. So, Catholicism is about being Christian, believing in Christ. Christ is the second person of the of the Trinity. So, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we're proclaiming we believe in one God that is three persons. Now, I went to school in Jersey, you know, what exit? I'm pretty sure that math for Marines, because I was a Marine too, math for Marines is, uh, if I have three, that can't equal one. If I have one, how does it become three? That's called a mystery. And this word mystery is a word that you're going to hear a lot. Mystery, in the sense of when we are talking about faith, about theology, which means we're studying God, we're trying to learn about God. Mystery is not a whodunit. Mystery isn't like, oh, I can figure this out. In fact, mystery means just the exact opposite. Mystery means there's no way I could even know about it unless God first revealed it. And even once he revealed it, that just means I had a very general understanding that it exists, not that I could possibly ever fathom what it is. And the single greatest Mystery as a Christian would be what do you think? <laughs> what here would be something that we could never figure out on our own? It has something to do with math for Marines? <laughs> right? The Trinity. the Trinity. The Trinity is the central mystery of Christianity. How can God be God 
but be Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Three different persons, but still only one God. Well, we can watch television and we see movies and we can see how amazing human imagination is, right? But even in our wildest imagination, we could not have come up with the understanding of one God, three persons, unless God first revealed it to us, okay? And so Catholicism, one other word that we don't have up here that starts with ch and ends in ch. Church, right? So a lot of times when people say Catholic, they think of this word here, right? Church. When uh, we talk about people that are in the, that are Catholics, we always say, well, they're part of the Catholic Church. But when we talk about our brothers and sisters that are Protestants, we never say they're part of the Protestant Church. So. What does that word then imply? If I don't say I'm part of the Protestant church, but I can say I'm part of the Catholic church, what, what kind of flavor do you get from that? One of the things when people ask and have on a lot of occasions, what church do you go to? I ask people that. Sure. When I introduce myself, and they're new in the neighborhood. Right. I want to invite them to church. Sure. Well, my whole thing is you, I say, I go to church, but I choose to worship at the Catholic church. Okay. I'm, you know, I so you're to making a Catholic. differentiation, yeah. which is kind of what we want to get to. So the first thing that people think of when they think of church is the building, the building. The building right? Where I'm going to. So. We'll just use that word building, right? So do you go to church? Yes, I do. I go to church. And I'm thinking in my mind a very specific building or place, right? Okay. But when you're talking to somebody and you say, yes, I go to church, um, if you ever go beyond that, uh, you'll hear people say, well, I'm a member of the Catholic Church. But you won't ever hear people say, I'm a member of the Protestant church. They'll say, I'm Protestant. So what does that imply? Again, not good or bad, but what does that make you think? See, I don't think they really say Protestant. I think they name their church. They I'm might. Methodist, I'm Baptist, yeah. I'm sure. Presbyterian. Right. Yeah. But you don't normally, at least it seems from the, a lot of the feedback that I've gotten, that church is very specifically almost always associated with that word Catholic, right? So we think of the building, but when I say the Catholic church, for instance, and I say, well, who's the boss? You think of the Pope, right? Mm -hmm. So if I say Protestant church, who's the boss? Here on earth. What's their um, denomination or whatever? Okay, so now we're breaking into denominations. You see what I'm saying? So the whole point is what I'm trying to say about Catholicism is we understand Catholicism as being Christian, having very specific common beliefs of all Christians because all Christians are Christians because they are and were members of the one church to start with. And the church that we're talking about is not specifically a building or a place, it's more, starts with that, but the, the body, the body of believers that believe the same thing, the universal belief, the one belief, the one faith, the one Lord, the one baptism, right? <coughs> that all Christians, believe in, but that just happened in human history and human time to have been brought to the fore by the name Catholic, because it describes God, one. So the church is also a body. 
What other, what word do we use today when we're talking about a body, say in business? Something that's corporate. Body. So a corporation is a body of like-minded or like-missioned people. So the church not only is a building, it's a body. And it's a body of like-minded believers. But what else is the church that has to do with the body? Corporate. Whose body is it? It's Christ. It's the body of Christ, right? So we get to that point, too. We call the church the mystical body of Christ. And we read that in Scripture. Christ is the head. We are the members. We read in Scripture that as members of the body, one member cannot <coughs> say to the other member, Hey, thumb, I don't need you. I'm the foot, and I can tell the thumb that I don't need you. No. We all are part of the one body. And that one body has a head. And that head is Jesus Christ. Right? But on earth, we have a visible head of that same body who happens to be, we use the word pope. That just means Father. It comes from the uh, Latin Papa, Pope. Okay. Well, guess what? Who is the head of a corporate being? What do you call somebody that's the person in charge of a corporation? What do they sit on, for instance? A chair. So we get the word chairman, right? The chairman of the board, for instance, the chair. Well, when we talk about that authority to run a corporation, we have that same setup here in the body of Christ. The chairman, the person that sits on the chair of Peter, is the Pope. Have you ever heard of this word before? <clears throat> I hope I spelled it right. <laughs> cathedral. Have you ever heard of a cathedral? What do we think of as a cathedral? Big church. Big church. Big church, right? <laughs> but do you know what that really means? This word here? The cathedra? You know what it means? Chair. So a cathedral was the church where the chair, in other words, where the bishop presided over his parish or his diocese. So these are not foreign concepts. When we talk about the Catholic Church, not only is the Catholic Church mystical, it's physical, because it's us, and it's material. It's a building, it's chairs, it's, it's all of these things, right? And why is that? Because as Catholics, one of the most important things that we understand is that when God made human beings, he made human beings as physical beings, right? That have intelligence or intellect. I think I spelled it right. And have spirit otherwise known as a soul. <coughs> so human beings are, for lack of a better term, shall we say, 
a hybrid being. Because when we look at all of creation, God starts with inanimate, and then he gives life, plant life. To that, he adds movement, capability to engage in a different way than a plant, which is animal, which guess what the word in Latin for soul is? Animus. So animals are that which has soul. Soul meaning can think, can move, can do those things. Then we jump over us and we get to pure spirit. Now what beings do we know that are pure spirit? Angels. Angels, right? So angels, as we know, are created beings. They are beings just like we are. In that God made them, but they are nothing like us in their makeup because they are pure spirit. What stands in between there, between physical and spiritual? Human. So we are physical beings like the animals. In other words, we have physical senses. We exist physically. The world, as we know it, starting from Genesis, the world was made for us. We weren't made for the world. The world was made as a gift to us because God said, I'm making you this, and I'm making all of this so you can exist in this plane of existence. So as human beings, we hear, see, smell, feel, taste, all of those things, right? We have passions. The three things that we have, and again, we'll talk about this later, is we have intellect, will, and passion. Now, passion just means, shall we say, appetites, right? So, a human being is the only thing that God has created that is both spiritual and physical. Kind of crazy, isn't it? Now, animals have a soul, but it's not immortal. Right? So the soul is just that which animates them. Our soul is what makes us spiritual. And what happens to our soul? It never dies. It's, et it's I don't want to say eternal, because it didn't exist forever, forever. But from the moment of conception, you received a, a soul from God. And God wants that soul. He wants you to, that soul to be with him forever. Saint Augustine, uh, who is a Catholic saint, uh, had a really great way of putting this. And I want you to think about it for a second. He says, God made us without us, but God will not save us without us. So we didn't have a say in whether we were created or not, but once we were created, God said, it's now up to you to cooperate in this. And so being Christian means that we understand that man has fallen, and we'll go over all of this, but man has fallen, and that that fall was permanent. There was nothing man could do to fix it. There was nothing. Once we <laughs> fell, our first parents, we talk about Adam and Eve, original sin. Once they 
disobeyed God because they are physical, intellectual, and spiritual. They gave their intellectual assent. They knew they weren't supposed to do something, and they did it physically. They did it, and it wounded their soul. And it then separated man from God. Because sin cannot exist in God's presence. As St. Paul says, uh, whoa, what a wretched man I am. Right? Elijah says, I am a man of unclean lips. Woe is me. Because there's no way we could restore that relationship. The only way that relationship could be restored was by God. And that gives us the story of Christianity, right? God made us. God made everything. But he didn't make robots. He made people that were physical, had intellect. In other words, knowledge. They were capable of knowing. <coughs> they had will, which means they had the capacity to choose. Free will. They had choice. We are not robots. God could have made a whole bunch of robots and would say, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, right? Yes, sir, yes, sir. But that's not love. <coughs> and when we talk about God, and we will here in a second, what is God? God is love. So these are all kind of the big thing that kind of ties us together. So as Catholics, we understand that all of the stuff that we just talked about is stuff that we didn't make up. This was stuff that was revealed to us. And what we call that is divine revelation. Divine revelation. Divine, that's pointing to who? God, right? So God, revelation, comes from a Latin word which means to unveil, to uncover, to expose. So the only way we know anything about God isn't because we're smart, it's because God revealed himself to us first. And this will be a theme over and over and over again. Christianity is the only major belief in the world in which God searches for man. Every other major belief is man searching for God. But we as Christians and as Catholics know that we could never find God. We wouldn't even know what God was unless God first revealed himself to us and then reached out to us. Scripture tells us while we were dead in sin, God reached out to us. By the way, the last book in the Bible is called Revelation, not Revelations. A lot of people say in the book of Revelations, it's like, no, there's only one revelation. There's only one uncovering. There's only one revealing uh, thing. So, divine revelation. And we'll go through this a uh, little more specifically when we get into the creed. But how does God reveal himself to us? And how do we specifically as Catholics understand this? So all Christians believe that God has revealed himself to us. How? How do we know what he says or what he does? What kind of thing do we look at? The Bible, the Bible right? So sacred scripture. Thank you, Mrs. McGillicuddy, for teaching me how to spell. 
sacred scripture. But in order for something to be written down, something else has to happen before that. How do I know what to write down? Divine revelation. Say what? Divine revelation. Through divine, and how was that revealed? How did you learn about your faith? Certainly before you could read. What did someone have to do? They preached it. They Preaching, there we go. The word had to be spoken first, right? So Catholic Church teaches sacred tradition with a big T, okay? Capital T. Before it could be written down, somebody had to preach it. Somebody had to say it, right? God said it, and then he said it to the apostles and the disciples, and they said it to somebody, and somewhere in that process, people said, you know what, this sounds pretty good. Maybe we should write this down. You know, because maybe people past us will, will want to know about this. But the word tradition with a capital T is very specific here in the Catholic Church. When we're saying tradition, we're not saying, well, you know, when my mother taught me how to make potato salad, our tradition was to put it this way and do that and do this. Okay, that's good, but that's not the same tradition, but it's the same concept. Tradition comes from a Latin word, which means to hand on, to pass on. So I have something, and I give it to you. Sacred tradition. So what the apostles received from Christ, they passed on to their disciples and their followers. And they did it through preaching the gospel first. And there's a real fancy word for that. It's called kerygma. Kerygma. That's another one of those things you hope they got a shot for. <laughs> I came down with kerygma last night. <laughs> Right, so kerygma just means preaching, preaching the word, so the gospel, right? And then the last thing of how we know what divine revelation is in the Catholic Church is called the magisterium. Big word, and I can almost spell it. Magisterium. Magisterium. You know, some enemy when we're watching a, a space fiction. Oh no, the magisterium is after us. Right? <laughs> but magister, when you think of a magister or a magistrate, what is a magistrate? Court. You think of a court, right? Okay, so a court. So who sits in the court that can make decisions? The judge. The judge. So a magistrate has the authority to judge. We have the word mister. That word comes from master. And that word it comes from is a, a form of magisterium. So magisterium means the teaching authority. teaching authority of the church. So what do we mean by that? Well, we mean when Jesus was walking the earth, he didn't go, hey guys, you know, I told you about this stuff, but hey, look, look what I got on, on uh, Amazon. I got this book. Hey, just take this book and uh, go spread it everywhere. And don't worry, it's all self-explanatory. You will have no questions when you read this thing. Right? That's not what happened, right? It was the other way around. While they were following him, listening to him, we read over and over and over again in the Gospels, and they did not understand, and they <coughs> did not get it, and they didn't, they fought amongst themselves. Hey, who's going to sit next to him? Who's the greatest when, when he gets to heaven? Totally missing the point. Why? Because they're human. They're sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, right? Broken. So somebody has to have the final say. Somebody has to say, well, you know, uh, 
Apollo taught me this, but uh, Barnabas taught me that, or Paul taught me this, but I'm listening to Peter, and he said this. And Paul, even in his uh, writings um, in the New Testament, says, you're not a follower of Paul. You're not a follower of Apollo or Barnabas. You're a follower of Christ. Christ is the final authority. But Christ handed that authority off. Again, when we get to, and we'll read about it. In Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 16, verses 17 through 19. And a matter of fact, we just read it, uh, a version of it from Mark's Gospel, uh, this past week at Mass. So, they're walking along the road, and Jesus says to his apostles, Who do the people say that I am? Well, some say that you're Elijah. Some say you're one of the prophets. Some say this. Some say that. And he says, Who do you say that I am? And they put their hands in their pockets and start looking down, kicking the road. And one person answered, Simon answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of God. That's when we get to this point. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Therefore, you are rock, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I give to you the keys to the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That sounds like authority to me. Now, paragraph later, he says, get behind me, Satan. But that's for another time, right? <laughs> so these are, the th these are uh, as we now step from being a uh, Christian to, okay, so what is it that makes us Catholic Christians? We start with divine revelation. That God and only God could reveal himself to us. We could not figure it out ourselves. We're already broken to begin with. How did God do that? Well, he reaches out to us first. How? First. First, through the prophets in the Old Testament, right? Prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet. Then after that, as uh, we read in uh, Timothy, I sent the prophets, and then after that, a son. I sent a son, right? So he sends the son. The son talks and talks and talks and tells us and shows us who and what God is. And at some point in time, we go, man, that's some good stuff. Does anybody got a plume? Anybody got something to write this down with? And before he leaves, he says, I'm leaving, but I'm going to send you the counselor. Right? The birth of the church is Pentecost, which we read about in Acts of the Apostles. And he breathes on them in the upper room, and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. He says, I'm leaving, but I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm going to leave you with some authority to understand what we're doing here. So that is the beginning of understanding what being Catholic is about. Is that we understand how God has spoken to us. He's spoken to us through words and deeds, some of which were recorded, all of which is inspired by the Holy Spirit and after that we had to figure out how to apply it in our broken lives because like we said it's not a hey let's go to the back to the hey the troubleshooting part what do I do in this circumstance right somebody had to be able to say this is what this means this is what this is referring to no it's not that no it's not this and as we go through church history a little bit, you'll see how almost immediately after Christ leaves, there are already breaks in the body of Christ. Well, no, Jesus really wasn't God. 
Okay, hold on for a second. No, Jesus really was God. Okay, but he really wasn't a man. Okay, hold on there, too. <laughs> so you can see they were wrestling. They're trying to figure it out. How do they figure it out? They don't figure it out as individuals. They figure it out as the body of Christ, as the church, the one church, one body, one Lord, one baptism, one faith. One Lord over all. The Catholic Church. We're all members of the Catholic Church. In fact, the bishop, Arch, the Archbishop of Atlanta, is held responsible for every soul in his diocese. Not just Catholics. Every soul is his responsibility as a direct descendant of the apostles. So, we'll end here. It's a lot to think about. I want you to, you know, think about this uh, over the, the week here. And as we, when we come back, and we will continue to get a little bit closer, we'll talk about well, what exactly is the Trinity. Uh, and we'll say how do we understand grace? How do we receive grace? What is grace? What is sin? We'll kind of get into that. So I want you to, um, your homework assignment. Oh no, you can't have this homework. <laughs> your homework assignment is, I want you to come up with two questions. Two questions about what we just talked about. Or it could be, you know, what you think we're going to be talking about. Just two questions. And there may be some repeating, but there may be a bunch that are off in a, in a different uh, area. And if you don't do that, you're all going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that too. <laughs> all right, so let's close with a prayer then, shall we? So as we said, as Catholics, for those that haven't done this before or I'm thinking about it. When we make the sign of the cross, it's a complete prayer. It's a complete statement about what you believe and what you, you want the world to witness to. Right? And so we will touch the left shoulder first and not the right. If you want to touch the right, I'll send you down to the Eastern Orthodox Church down the street. <laughs> In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, we give you thanks for being with us today, your mystical body of Christ. We are here as members of your body. We are here as members of your heart and of your light and of your truth and of your beauty and goodness. We ask that you help us now this week as we start to explore and try to become closer to you as we would in any human relationship. If I want to be closer to someone, I want to know more about them. And so help us to want to know more about you. Help us to live with that thought in our mind this week and how we would want to act and be seen by that person that we want to get closer to. And we know that you will help us do that by sending the Holy Spirit down upon us. You tell us that where two or three are gathered, you are there amongst us. And so we trust in your word, we trust in your truth, and we trust in your love. We also ask at this time for, in a moment of silence, that you hear the prayers of those here, that they will raise up in silence to you. Dear Lord, you hear the prayers of your faithful. You hear the prayers of those that love you, that want to be with you. Help them with these prayers. Acknowledge those prayers if you can. Grant them if it is your holy will. And we ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 The Lord be with you. 
and the leaders there. there. May Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And the class is ended. Go in peace. <laughs> 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 <laughs>